tonight uh i have a, a special presentation so difficult to to handle but uh by god's grace i believe that uh, we shall be profited and uh, he shall be able to give us the strength to go through this and so wherever you are tuned in welcome and uh, we just pray that uh, we shall be able to speak things in love and uh, know what the will of God is upon our lives. This is uh, a presentation on uh, the scene of self-abuse. Shall we pray as um, we enter into this session? Dear Father in heaven, wonderful are thy ways, and uh, you have chosen human instrumentalities, Lord as uh, a means and agencies of reaching your people the angels could have done the job better but lord as we share in these uh, teachings and uh, admonitions then uh, we are chiseled and our character is changed from glory to glory and so far the things we read of let them apply to our lives and uh, be able to bring changes to our lives in jesus name amen Now, as uh, you can see, it is uh, uh, the scene of self-abuse, uh, a mind affair. And uh, I want us to look at uh, look at First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen and twenty. And so, I'll go right ahead and share first. Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. We are told, What know ye, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which uh, ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, that really sets up uh, our presentation, the sin of self-abuse, mind affair, that our bodies should be used as the temples of God. The sin of self-pollution is one of the most destructive evils over practiced by fallen man. In many respects, it is uh, several degrees worse than common wardom and has in it strained more awful consequences, though practiced by numbers who will uh, shudder at the thought of criminal connections with the, a prostitute per se. It uh, exerts the powers of nature to undo action and produces violent secretions which uh, necessarily and speedily exhaust the vital principles and energy, as we shall see from various articles and uh, doctor's reports and what science have shown that what it leads the body to be deficient of. And so uh, in this uh, practice that uh, many indulge in, the, the muscles become flaccid and feeble. The tone and natural action of the nerves relaxed and impeded. The understanding confused, the memory oblivious, the judgment perverted, the will in the in that minute and wholly without uh, energy to resist. The eyes appear languishing and without expression and the countenance vacant. The appetite ceases for the stomach is incapable of performing its proper office. Nutrition fails, tremors, fears and terrors are generated and thus the wretched victim drags out uh, a most uh, miserable existence till supernuated even before he had time to arrive at man's estate with a mind often debilitated even to a state of uh, idiotism. His worthless body tumbles into the grave and his guilty soul, guilty of self-murder, is hurried into the awful presence of it is judge. Uh, looking at uh, what actually the medical report has and what it has driven people into, and so many cases have been uh, reported and uh, some even where we shall see that the prophetess once was called to pray for a person who was uh, indulging in the same sin. And uh, when she was shown this is the sin, she refused to pray. 
there are testimonies which have been given of this uh, vice, both from the people who are struggling with it or uh, medical fractioneers, marriage counselors, and uh, many people. And uh, the reports are not good per se. And so this is a snare that uh, the devil will want to plunge the youth and even the marriage into. And um, sometimes people say that uh, because it is limited to me, uh, the sense of self-abuse, that is masturbation, then uh, why is it a harmful when it's like just uh, you will do an enjoyment or for yourself on that? And so it is good that we look into the Bible and uh, be able to see what uh, the word of God will say uh, of uh, sexual purity and all that. This is one of those difficult subjects to deal with. But then, God willing, we can uh, be able to glean some things uh, from uh, what the Lord has revealed it, uh, about these issues. In the book, uh, Solomon Appeal, page 168, paragraph 2, thus we read, I have sought to arouse parents to their duty. Your children practice secret vice and they deceive you. So self-abuse, masturbation is a secret vice and it is a deception as um, we see from uh, the pen of inspiration. It continues to say, you have such an implicit confidence in them that you think them too good and innocent to be capable of secret, secretly practicing iniquity. Parents fondle and pet their children and indulge them in pride, but do not restrain them with firmness and decision. They are so much afraid of their willful, stubborn spirits that they fear to come in contact with them. But the sin of negligence, which was marked against Eli, will be their sin and so we found that this is a vice that is practiced secretly and uh, parents have not done their duty uh, to make sure that uh, they leave their children in the right path so that they may not be ensnared in this sin and so we ask ourselves what does the bible and the spirit of prophecy say about uh, the sin of self uh, uh, self-abuse masturbation and uh, sexual impurity uh, it is one of the most frequently asked questions then many christians have found it difficult to answer this question according to the bible because the bible never mentioned masturbation specifically to understand how god feels about this subject then we must examine other verses that deal with issues such as lust and uh, self-control and purity also we must examine it is fruit to see if it is from god and so this is what I'll be trying to go through. And so the issue is, does God care about what we do in privacy of our bedrooms? Um, just to be straight, sex is God's invention. And so why do I have to talk about sex when dealing with masturbation? Because masturbation is self-sex, by the way. Now, God is the mastermind of every pure sex, and his creation is worth far more to him than it is for us. And so... God intended everything to be done in their in its season and in the rightful order. And that is why he never left Adam onto his own when he saw that uh, he didn't have some someone fit for him. He provided Eve as a, a, a helpmate. And it is only in marriage that this uh, manifestation of intimacy can be fully enjoyed in the depth of which it was created, not only not any other form of uh, sexual habits, that it should be limited in a marriage uh, 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 setup. And uh, we shall be seeing that even in marriage setup, there are some excesses we are told never to go. And so in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, in the book of Hebrews, uh, let us look at Hebrews 13.4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So you can be in marriage too and be practicing sin. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefined, but 
warmongers and adulterers, God will judge. That is in KJV. The other one was in NIV. So the more beautiful and uh, unique something is, like sexual intercourse, the more power it holds over our lives, either for good or bad influence. That is why it is so easy for the devil to corrupt the most precious of God's gifts. When we become more in love with the gift, gifts than the one who endowed them, the things that were designed to bless us begin to destroy us instead. Yes, God cares about what we do with our bodies in public or in private. He doesn't want us to abuse ourselves in any way. In fact, an older definition of masturbation is self-abuse. Although more modern dictionaries may no longer carry this definition, they are still linked together under self-abuse. And uh, when looking at self-abuse, uh, it is a noun, abuse of oneself or one's abilities. Number two, masturbation. That is the dictionary, what um, it um, uh, portrays. And so we cannot say that this is uh, something pure. As we have read in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, further, that uh, unlawful sexual relation defile our own bodies. In NIV, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. You can check that in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 18. Uh, again, uh, in uh, Solomon Appeal, page 165, look at this. We read, I have felt deeply as I have seen the powerful influence animal passions have had in controlling men and women of no ordinary intelligence and ability. They are capable of engaging in a good work of exerting a powerful influence were they not enslaved by base passions. They have listened to the most solemn, impressive discourses upon the judgment which seemed to bring them before the tribunal of God, causing them to fear and quake. Yet an hour will hardly elapse before they have been engaged in their favorite bewitching sin, polluting their own bodies. They were such slaves to this awful crime that they seemed devoid of power to control their passions. We have labored for some honestly. We have entreated. We have wept and prayed over them. Yet we have known that right amid all our honest effort and honest effort and distress, the force of sinful habit has obtained the mastery. And then uh, she continues to say in 165.1, these sins will be committed. The conscience of some of the guilty through severe attacks of sickness or by being powerfully convicted have been aroused and have so scold them that it has led to confession of these things with deep humiliation. Others are like guilty. They have practiced this sin nearly their whole lifetime and with their broken down constitutions and with their sieve like memories are reaping the result of this pernicious habit yet are too proud to confess. They are secretive and have not shown compactions of conscience for this great sin and wickedness. They seem to be insensible to the influence of the Spirit of God. The sacred and common are alike to them. The common practice of a vice so degrading us, polluting their own bodies, has not led to bitter tears and heartfelt repentance. They feel that their sin is against themselves alone. Here they make mistake. Are they deceased in body or mind? Others are made to feel. Others suffer. Mistakes are made. The memory is deficient. The imagination is at fault. And there is deficiency everywhere, which seriously does what affects those with whom they live and who associate with them. This feel mortification and regret because these things are known by another. So isn't it still better to masturbate than to commit fornication? Some people will ask such a thing. The easy answer to this question has been, yes, it is better to masturbate because at best it corrupts only one person. It certainly is the lesser of two evils. However, why would be, why would a loving, holy, all-powerful God abandon you to a situation in which you have to choose any evil, whether it be lesser or greater? To really answer this question, we must again go back to God's original plan for sex. But in a more precise way, masturbation is a result of fornication and what is stored in mind, and it should not be 
compared to lesser seen or wet dreams at any given uh, day. And so people have uh, tried to imagine that um, uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, better to do masturbation or self-sex than to do fornication. But uh, actually what drives the mind to even think of that and uh, commit uh, such a things? And so first of all, masturbation will not truly leave the sexual pressure that one may feel. It may for a short moment, but uh, in the long run, it only creates a deeper desire and capacity for sex, which will lead to more masturbation. If you let yourself become enslaved to a sexual high, you will find that you need to go increasingly extreme to extreme acts to maintain the same degree of excitement. Uh, the previous one will lead you to the another one and to another and to this excitement. There are even ungodly sex therapists who recommend masturbation as a way of increasing sexual desire, not lessening it. And so you find that even they, they have studied and they find that to uh, really increase a sexual desire, you must masturbate. But God did not call us into excesses. He did not create us into excesses. He created us to be temperate in all things. And so this call to increase sexual desire creates a vicious circle like the junk who craves a fix but is only temporarily satisfied. The more he indulges in his dependency, the more ensnared by addiction he becomes. Like a, a drunkard starts with one glass of um, alcohol and then the body, as it assimilates this, it starts demanding for it to reach to a certain level, the amount has to be increased. So is the scene of self-abuse and masturbation that uh, it, it doesn't lessen your desires for more, but it increases desires for more and the, the and the more and the more. This is the nature of all sin, actually, because good things will not lead you to excesses and uh, being an anxious of things. And that is why Jesus declared that all who sin become a slave to sin in John 8, 34. Furthermore, masturbation usually involves fantasy, visualizing, and often pornography. The Bible is very clear as to what God expects of us in these areas of fantasy and lust. It teaches that we must not look lustfully at each other nor behave in a such a manner as to entice others to lust after us. And so when uh, uh, when when you go to Job 31 verses 1 to 3, it is interesting to find what is written in the book of Job. Uh, in the book of Job 31, 1 to 3, in the Living Bible, we are told, I made a covenant with my eye not to look with lust upon a girl. I know full well that the Almighty God sends calamity on those who do. And then in Matthew 5, 28, you have heard that it say it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in this in his heart. And um, just um, to know the extent of how these things are, are bad, you have just to listen to uh the accounts of what have been in the people who are involved in this thing. In pamphlet um, 011, in pamphlet 011, uh, page, uh, page, uh, page, uh, page 46, this scene of self-abuse, masturbation, and uh, sexual ex uh, excesses, uh, we are told of what it has done even to some youths and uh, we will read some things that are startling about uh, this issue. And uh, you may say, where is the love of Christ? Where is the bringing the people to God? Isn't this a condemnation? No, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just going through the materials so that we may see what uh, the Bible talks about this and what science have proved that it is and all this stuff. So here is what Sister White says that uh, even these things, this this fantasy, sexual fantasies have been going on while the youths were listening to sermons. I have felt deeply as I have seen the powerful influence of animal passions. 
I have seen, so I have I have felt deeply as I have seen the powerful influence animal passions have had in controlling men and women of no ordinary intelligence and ability. They are capable of engaging in a good work of exerting a powerful influence were they not enslaved by base passions. My confidence in humanity has been terribly shaken. I have been shown that persons of apparently good deportment not taking unwarrantable liberties with the other sex were guilty of doing what? Practicing secret vice nearly every day of their lives. And she says, my confidence in humanity has been shaken terribly. She continues to say, this terrible scene has not even been refrained from while most solemn meetings have been in session. So to, to, to just understand the viciousness viciousness of this act is that this thing has been even practiced during solemn meetings going on they have listened to the most solemn uh impressive discourses upon the judgment which seem to bring them before the tribunal of god causing them to fear and quake yet an hour will hardly elapse before they have been engaged in their favorite bewitching sin polluting their own bodies they were such slaves to this awful crime that they seem devoid of power control their passions we have labored for some honestly we have entreated we have wept and prayed over them yet we have known that right amid all our honest effort and distress the force of sinful habit has obtained the mastery these sins will be committed the consciences of some of the guilty through severe attacks of sickness all being powerful convicted have been aroused and have so excoured them that it has led to confession of these things which with deep humiliation Others are alike guilty. They have practiced this sin nearly their whole lifetime and in their broken down constitution and with their sieve-like memories are reaping the result of this pernicious habit, yet are too proud to confess. They are secretive and have not shown compunctions of conscience for the great sin and wickedness. My confidence in the Christian experience of such is very small. They seem to be insensible to the influence of the Spirit of God. The sacred and common are alike to them. The common practice of a vice so degrading as the polluting of their own bodies has not led to bitter tears and heartfelt repentance. They feel that their sin is against themselves alone. Here they may they mistake. Are they deceased in body or mind? Others are made to feel others suffer. Mistakes are made. The memory is deficient. The imagination is at fault and there is deficiency everywhere which seriously affect those with whom they live and who associate with them. This feel mortification and regret because these things are known by another, but um, it doesn't lead to true repentance, which bringeth about a change of um, the lifestyle that um, they are living. And so, while we look at uh, Job that one one two three and Matthew five twenty eight, uh, the verses. Uh, refer to men lasting after women. All women know that it can very easily be reversed to apply to them as well because they may say, okay, the Bible is addressing men lasting after men. But also, when you read the book of Romans chapter 1, we have seen that women also last after women. And Paul says in First Timothy, I think First Timothy, that this is unnatural. Men may be more easily visually stimulated than women but women can be just as vulnerable to sexual fantasy in the emotional realm also so science has proven both are seen in god's eyes and both can be brought into subjection by controlling our thoughts uh, through christ's power all sexual immorality begins with a thought um lustful thought not taken captive will eventually lead to other perversions because sin reproduces itself in increasing greater measures. If we do not deal with our evil thoughts, they will take root in our hearts then. It is for this reason that God is so concerned with our thought uh, our life. Jesus came not only to deliver us from our outward sins, but also from wickedness that begins in the heart. And uh, we uh, are told that um, God, your heart so diligently from it comes the issues of life. And so, Masturbation and self-abuse is referred to as the uh, affair of the mind uh, in many journals. And since masturbation begins with the, with sin in the mind, uh, that is why they call it the affair of the mind. Uh, 
and uh, as it starts there, it inflicts in the body the passions that are not are unnatural. And though it brings a short-lived gratification, it makes one feel defiled when continued on a regular basis. In fact, it's a form of fornication, as I have said earlier and um, highlighted. Uh, it includes many other sexual sins, such as pornography and the use of sexual toys for gratification. God never meant that anyone should use sexual toys to gratify themselves. People who are not satisfied with God's plan for sex commit adultery by using evil things to experience weird and unlawful forms of sexual intercourse. Some verses in Ezekiel actually describe this kind of um, fornication. And uh, in an imagery language, when you read Ezekiel 16, 15 to 17, uh, although I'm not dogmatic about this, it seems that this is uh, one of the things that uh, Ezekiel is addressing. And he says, in Ezekiel 16, 15 to 17. But um, you trusted in and relied on your own beauty and were unfaithful to God and played the harlot in idolatry because of your renown and you poured out your fornication upon anyone who passed by as you worshipped the idols of every nation which prevail over you and your beauty was his. And you took some of your garments and made for yourself gaily decorated high places or shrines and played the harlot on them, things which should not come and that which should not take a place. You did also take your fair jewels and beautiful vessels of my gold and my silver, which I had given you and made for yourself images of men and you played the harlot with them. You, you, you look that um, uh, the Bible says that um, they made images of people and played halo, which means that they did not do uh, prostitution with these people, but they made the images of these people and played halo. It, it sounds in imagery as the scene of self-abuse and uh, uh, masturbation to me, although uh, I'm ready to be corrected on that. And so does it only affect those who practice it? No. The entire mind is given up to low passion. The moral and intellectual are overborne by the baser powers. The body is enervated. The brain is weakened. The material there deposited to nourish the system is squandered. The drain upon the system is great. The fine nerves of the brain, by being excited to unnatural action, become benumbed and, in a measure, Paralyzed, the moral and intellectual are growing weaker while the animal passions are growing stronger and being more largely developed by this exercise. And uh, there is the appetite of unhealthful food, clamors for indulgence uh, for this thing. It is impossible to fully arouse the moral sensibilities of those persons who are addicted to the habit of self-abuse to appreciate eternal things. You cannot lead such to delight in spiritual exercises. Impure thought says and control the imagination, fascinate the mind, and next follows an almost uncontrollable desire for impure acts. If the mind then were educated to contemplate upon elevating subject, the imagination trained to reflect upon pure and holy things, it will be fortified against this terrible debasing soul and body destroying indulgence. It will become accustomed to linger with delight upon the high the heavenly, the pure, and sacred, and could not be attracted to this base corrupt, uh, uh, vile indulgence. And so, um, God intends to give gifts to every person. God intends to give every gift to every person so that they may be profitable to the church. And so, when uh, we deliberate our minds, we disqualify ourselves from being vessels in the sanctuary and then reducing the number of those who can be used um, uh, for the holy service and so in solemn Sol solemn appeal page 168 solemn appeal page 168 we are told what can we say of those who are living right in the blazing light of truth yet daily practicing and following in a course of sin and crime forbidden exciting pleasures have a charm for them and hold and control their entire being 
such take pleasure in unrighteousness and iniquity and must perish outside of the seat of God with every abominable uh, thing. And so, um, then what can we say? Can, can, can we be freed from this? This is a place where we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our everyday life. The Holy Spirit is not a vague force, but the power and the presence of the Father and the Son to comfort us and strengthen us against the sins that used to rule us before we were born again. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the very ability that Jesus had to resist temptation. He depended completely upon the Father, and so must we. Something we must know is that God is not the one who is tempting us in this area to test us. God is on our side and wants to set us free from these things, not lead us into them. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. James chapter 1, verses 13, 14. And so victory can be found uh, in this thing. So God wants us to overcome every sin and temptation in uh, our lives and we are told in first Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 no temptation has saved you except that which is common to man and God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear but when you are tempted he will also provide a way out so that you can stand under it and uh, uh, in uh, in second Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5 uh, the Bible says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Uh, uh, another uh, verse that uh, really is um, uh, promising to us is Romans 6, 11, 14. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey it is evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, for you are not under the law, but under the grace. And uh, in uh, Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but us was in all points tempted like us we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so 2 Corinthians 7, 1, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that condemnates the body and spirit, practicing holiness out of reverence for God. And uh, in uh, uh, Galatians 5, 1, in Amplified Bible, in this freedom, Christ has made us free, completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held and ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. I think this is um, interesting to uh, put it on the screen so that you may see what the Amplified Bible says. Can I really overcome this and other sexual desires? In Galatians 5, 1 Amplified Bible, in this freedom, Christ has made us free, completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be humbled and held, snared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. And so confess. And when we confess, God is faithful that he will be able to forgive us all our iniquities. We are to flee from and reject anything that aggravates this sin. Disconnect from any kind of um, anything that will induce our mind to uh, uncleanness. And so uh, another thing is self-control. If we have self-control and we take the effort to overcome by the grace of God. We will win the battle. No sin is so greater than the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, in uh, 
first Thessalonians 522 523 to 24 uh we are told may God himself the God of peace sanctify you through and through may your whole spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ the one who calls you is faithful and he will be able to do it and so back to Solomon appeal page 168 paragraph uh, two looking at uh, the sin of self-abuse or what you call the masturbation or the affair of the mind. The extortion of Peter is of the highest value to all who are striving for immortality. Those of like precious faith are addressed. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith which with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and goodness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by this he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through uh, lust. In this healthful living, many have tried righteousness by works and depended on themselves to overcome sin or be recommended to God by their works, but they have failed miserably and gave up Christianity or victory over sin. And so that is why we are told that God himself is the one that can only uh, sanctify us. And so uh, he continues saying, and beside this, give all diligence Add your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, goodness, and to goodness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and we cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he has purged, he was purged from his all sins, wherefore the rather Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hence, God has promised us. God has promised us victory of uh, every sin that uh, comes our way. And so we have to believe he who has promised will perform uh, will perform the work of uh, sanctifying us and uh, making us uh, whole again, not in the coming life, but in this life that uh, we are in. We can be sure, uh, according to Philippians 4.13, that uh, God himself will help us to accomplish everything that uh, uh, he has started in, uh, in, uh, in uh, our lives. Uh, going on in Solemn Appeal, page 171 to 176, talking about um, uh, keeping the bed and defile. First of all, let us go back to the book of uh, Hebrew. Uh, the book of Hebrew, chapter, it should be Hebrew, Hebrews, Hebrew chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefined, but for among us and adulterers, God will judge. And so, apart from just the single people performing this act of uh, self-abuse, the affair of the mind, and masturbation, we find that this vice is also practiced in family. And just think about it as we go through these uh, appeals. In uh, Solomon Appeal, page 171 to 176, we read this.
The marriage covenant covers sins of the darkest hue. Some men and women professing goldness debase their own bodies through the indulgence of the corrupt, corrupt passions, which lowers them beneath the brute creation. They abuse the powers God has given them to be preserved in sanctification and honor. Health and life are sacrificed upon the altar of base passion. The higher, nobler powers are brought into subjection to the animal propensities. Those who thus sin are not acquainted with the result of their cause. It's talking about self-abuse and sexual excesses. Who we'll all see the amount of suffering they bring upon themselves by their own wrong and sinful indulgence, they will be alarmed. Some at least will shun the cause of sin which brings such a dreaded wages. A miserable existence is entailed upon so large a class that death to them will be preferable to life. And many do die prematurely, their lives being sacrificed in the inglorious work of excessive indulgence of the animal passions. Because they are married, they think they can commit no sin. And so these sexual excesses, people engage in the thing that because it is in uh, in marriage circle, it is not sin, but it is being said it is sin. These men and women will one day learn what lust is, and behold the result of it is gratification. Passion may be found of a base, passion may be found of as base a quality in the marriage relation as outside of it. The apostle Paul exhorts husbands to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Ephesians 5.25 28 and 29. It is not pure love which accentuates a man to make his wife an instrument to administer to his lust. It is the animal passions which clamor for indulgence. How few men show their love in the manner specified by the apostle, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might not pollute it but sanctify and cleanse it that it should be holy and without blemish. This is the quality of love in the married relation which God recognizes as holy. Continued on, we are told love is a pure and holy principle. Lustful passion will not admit of restraint and will not be dictated or controlled by reason. It is blind to consequences. It will not reason from cause to effect. Many women are suffering from great debility and with settled disease brought upon them because the laws of their being have not been regarded. Nature's laws have been trampled upon. The brain nerve power is squandered by men and women because called into unnatural action to gratify these base passions. And this highest monster, base law passion, assumes the de delicate name of love. And she continues to say, many professed Christians are more animal than divine. They are, in fact, about all animal. A man of this type degrades the wife he has promised to nourish and cherish. She is made by him an instrument to minister to the gratification of his low lustful propensities. Very many women submit to become slaves to lustful passion. They do not possess their bodies in sanctification and honor. The wife does not retain the dignity and self-respect she possessed previous to marriage. This holy institution should have preserved and increased her woman respect and holy dignity. Her chaste, dignified, godlike womanhood has been consumed upon the altar of base passion. It has been sacrificed to please her husband. She soon loses respect for her husband, who does not regard the loss to which the brute creation yields obedience. The married life becomes a galling yoke, for love dies out, and frequently distrust, jealousy, and hate takes it is place. No man can truly love his wife if she will patiently submit to become his slave and minister to his degraded passions. She loses in her passive submission the value she once possessed in his eye. He sees her degraded down from everything elevating to a low level. And soon he suspects that she will perhaps as tamely submit to be degraded by another as by himself. He doubts her constancy and purity, tires of her, 
and seeks new objects which will arouse and intensify his selfish passions. The law of God is not regarded. These men are worse than brutes. They are demons in human form. They are unacquainted with the elevating and noble principles of true or unsanctified love. The wife becomes jealous of the husband. She suspects that he will just as readily pay his addresses to another as to her if opportunity should offer. She sees that he is not controlled by conscience nor the fear of God. All these sanctified barriers are broken down by lustful passions. All that is godlike in the husband is made the servant of low brutish lust. The world is filled with men and women of this order and need test year expensive houses contain a hell within. Imagine, if you can, what the offspring of such a parent must be. Will not the children sing lower in the scale than their parents? Parents give the stamp of character to their children. Children that are born of these parents inherit qualities of mind from them which are of a low and base order. Saturn nourishes anything tending to corruption. The matter now to be settled is, to be settled is Shall the wife feel bound to yield implicitly to the demands of her husband when she sees that nothing but these passions control him, and when her reason and knowledge are convinced that she does it to the injury of her body, which God has enjoined upon her to possess in sanctification and honor, and to preserve a living sacrifice to God? It is not pure love. It is not pure holy love which leads the wife to gratify the animal propensities of her husband at the expense of health and life. If she possesses true love and wisdom, she will seek to divert the mind of her husband from the gratification of lustful passions to high and spiritual themes, dwelling upon interesting spiritual subjects. It may be necessary to humbly and affectionately urge, even at the risk of his displeasure, that she cannot debase her body by yielding to sexual excess. She should, in a tender, kind manner, remind him that God has the first and highest claim upon her entire being, which claim she cannot disregard, for she will be held accountable in the great day of God. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own, for ye are bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye servants of men. 1 Corinthians 7, 23. Woman can do much, if she will, through her judicious influence, by elevating her affection and in sanctification and honor preserving her refined womanly dignity. In thus doing, she can save her husband and herself, thus performing a double work and fulfilling her high mission, sanctifying her husband by her influence. In this delicate, difficult matter to manage, much wisdom and patience are necessary, as well as moral courage and fortitude. Strength and moral can be found in prayer. Sincere love is to be the ruling principle of the heart. Love to God and love to your husband can be the only right ground of action. Let the woman decide that... It is the husband's prerogative to have full control of her body and to mold her mind to suit his own, his in every respect, and run in the same channel of his own, and she yields her individuality. Her identity is lost, submerged in that of her husband. She is a mere machine for him to move and control, a creature of his will and pleasure. He thinks for her. He thinks for her, decides for her, and asks for her. She dishonors God in this passive position. She has a responsibility before God, which it is her duty to preserve. And so you find that um, um, we will not excuse uh, the issues of uh, sexual excesses in uh, even within the marriage boundaries. It is something that should be shunned. And uh, uh, looking into more of science and what it has to say about um, uh, this as we enter into the last section. Uh, this is masturbation and insanity 
in uh, testimonies to sexual behavior, Appendix A, page 268 to uh, page um, 217. As um, we just look at um, what do science uh, have to say on uh, uh, this issue. We read that uh, in his scholarly study on uh, masturbatory insanity, the history of an idea, Journal of Mental Science, uh, 108, 1, January 1962, EH here refers to a study of 500 patients admitted consecutively to Iowa State Psychopathic Hospital. He states that the authors of the study, Malamud W. and Palma G., the role played by masturbation in the causation of mental disturbances, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disorders, uh, 76 to 1932, found that in 22 cases, masturbation was apparently the most important cause of disorder, that is mental disorder. He then continues, the authors included concluded that it was the mental conflict engaged by masturbation rather than the habit itself which led to the illness. And they believe this conclusion to be supported by the efficacy of uh, psychotherapy directed towards readjusting the patient's ideas about masturbation. Yet the fact that 15 of the 22 patients suffered from depression must raise doubts about the validity even of this temperance conclusion for the depressed patient is not only prone to blame himself for neglect of what he believes to be the rules of health but also tends to recover from his illness whether treated by psychotherapy or not that is page 22 thus here questions the conclusion of malamud and palma but says significantly that their study is one of the very few attempts indeed as far as my reading goes the only real attempt at a scientific study of the masturbatory hypothesis, the hypothesis that masturbation can cause insanity. After acknowledging that there is no way of disproving the masturbatory hypothesis, Hare offers his final conclusion. All we can say from the evidence is that the association between masturbation and mental order is weak and inconstant, and that therefore, if masturbation is a causal factor, it is probably not a very important one, the Minister of Healing, page 19. But this is being quoted in uh, the appendix of uh, Testimonies to Sexual Behavior, pages 268, 270. It continues to say, so, although this authority minimizes the possibility that masturbation and insanity might be linked, he does not dismiss it, dismiss it altogether. Even more significantly, he has discovered that there has been only one real attempt to test the hypothesis scientifically. Writing of masturbation in their adolescent development and adjustment, Mark Grohill, Book, Account, Book Company, 1956, Lester C. and Alice Crow conclude, the effect of this form of sex perversion are not yet fully known. Dr. David Horobin and an MD and PhD from Oxford University states, the amount of zinc in semen is such that one ejaculation may get rid of all the zinc that can be absorbed from the intestine in one day. This has a number of consequences. Unless the amount lost is replaced by an increased dietary intake, repeated ejaculation may lead to a real zinc deficiency with various problems developing, including impotence. It is even possible, given the importance of zinc for the brain, that 19th century moralists were correct when they said that repeated masturbation could make one mad. Zinc. This is Vita Book, St. Albans, Vermont, 1981, page 8. And... Uh, Sister Wai says, I have felt deeply as I have seen the powerful influence animal passions have had in controlling men and women of no ordinary intelligence and ability. They are, capable, they are capable in engaging in a good work of exerting a powerful influence were they not enslaved by base passion. My confidence in humanity has been terribly shaken. I have been shown that persons of apparently good deportment, not taking unwarrantable liberties with the other sex, 
were guilty of practicing secret vice nearly every day of their life. This terrible scene has not even been refrained from while most solemn meetings have been in session. And uh, we uh, read this. And so here is one of the cases where I was telling you that uh, she was once called to pray for a person who was indulging in this and this is what um, uh, she writes that um, she did. One who requested prayer for healing. This is in Child Guidance, page 100, 450. One who requested for prayer he for who requested prayer for healing. My husband and I once attended a meeting where our sympathies were enlisted for a brother who was a great sufferer with the physic. He was pale and emaciated. He requested the prayers of the people of God. He said that his family was sick and that he had lost a child. He spoke with feeling of his bereavement. He said that he had been waiting for some time to see brother and sister White. He had believed that if they would pray for him, he would be healed. After the meeting closed, the brethren called our attention to the case. They said that they said that the church was assisting them, that his wife was sick and his child had died. The brethren had met at his house and united in praying for the afflicted family. We were much worn and had the burden of labor upon us during the meeting and wished to be excused. I had resolved not to engage in prayer for anyone unless the spirit of the Lord should dictate in the matter. That night, we bowed in prayer and presented his case before the Lord. We entreated that we might know the will of God concerning him. All we desired was all we desired was that God might be glorified. Will the Lord have us pray for this afflicted man? We left the burden with the Lord and retired to rest. In a dream, the case of that man was clearly presented. His cause from his childhood up was shown. And that if we should pray, the Lord will not hear us, for he regarded iniquity in his heart. The next morning, the man came for us to pray for him. We took him aside and told him we were sorry to be compelled to refuse his request. I related my dream, which he acknowledged was true. He had practiced self-abuse from his boyhood up, and he had continued the practice during his married life, but said he would try to overcome, but said he would try to break himself of it. Sorry. This man had a long established habit to overcome. He was in the middle age of, of life. His moral principles were so weak that when brought in conflict with long-established indulgence, they were overcome. Here was a man debasing himself daily and yet daring to venture into the presence of God and ask an increase of strength which he had vile, vilely squandered and which, if granted, he will consume upon his lust. What forbearance has God? What forbearance has God? If he should deal with man according to his corrupt ways who could live in his sight. What if we had been less cautious and carried the case of this man before God while he was practicing iniquity? Would the Lord have heard? Would he have answered? For thou art not a God that hath flesh and wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And she continues to say, this is not a solitary case. Even the marriage relation was not sufficient to preserve this man from the corrupt habits of his youth. I wish I could be convinced that such a cases as the one I have presented are rare, but I know they are frequent. And so she goes ahead and talks about a self-murderer, a mister, name with hell, professed to be a devoted follower of Christ. He was in every feeble, he was in very feeble health. Our feelings of sympathy were called out in his behalf. His case was shown me in a vision. I saw that he was deceived in regard to himself, that he was not in favor with God. He had practiced self-abuse until he was a mere wreck of humanity. This vice was shown me as an abomination in the sight of God. So the prophet says that self-abuse, masturbation, sexual excesses are abominations to God. He had practiced this habit so long he seemed to have lost the control of himself. He was naturally a smart man, possessing more than common abilities. But how were all his powers of body and mind brought into subjection by Satan 
and consumed upon his altar. This man had gone so far he seemed to be left of God. He would go into the woods and spend days and nights in fasting and prayer that he might overcome this great sin and then will return to his old habits. God did not hear his prayers. He asked God to do for him what had been in his power to do for himself. He had vowed to God time and again, and had as often broken his vows and given himself up to his own corrupt lust, until God had left him to work his own ruin. He has since died. This is a sad story. He was a self-murderer. The purity of heaven will never be marred, with his society an appeal to an indulged daughter and uh, this are extract from a letter to a self-willed girl who was practicing secret vice that is uh, self-abuse masturbation she says and writes to this girl your mind is impure you are you were relieved from care and labor altogether too long household duties will have been one of the richest blessings that you could have had Weariness will not have injured you one tenth as much as have your lascivious thoughts and conduct. You have received incorrect ideas in regard to girls and boys associating together, and it has been very congenial to your mind to be in the company of the boys. You are not pure in heart and mind. You have been injured by reading love stories and romances, and your mind has been fascinated by impure thoughts. Your imagination has become corrupt until you seem to have no power to control your thoughts. Satan leads you captive as he pleases. Your conduct has not been chaste, modest, or becoming. You have not had the fear of God before your eyes. You have so often dissembled in order to accomplish your plans that you bear a violated conscience. My dear girl, unless you stop just where you are, ruin is surely before you. Seize your daydreaming, your castle building. Stop your thoughts from running in the channel of folly and corruption you cannot safely associate with the boys a tide of temptation is roused and surges in your breast having a tendency to uproot principle female virtue and true modest if you go on in your willful headstrong course what will be your fate you are in danger for you are just upon the point of sacrificing your eternal interest at the altar of passion passion is obtaining positive control of your entire being passion of what quality of a base destructive nature by yielding to it you will embitter the lives of your parents bring sadness and shame to your sister sacrifice your own character and forfeit heaven and a glorious immortal life are you ready to do this you are forward you love the boys and love to make them the theme of your conversation out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh habits have become powerful to control you and you have learned to deceive in order to carry out your purposes and accomplish your desires. I do not consider your case hopeless. If I did, my pain will not be tracing these lines. In the strength of God, you can redeem the uh, past. Keep clear of the boys. In their society, your temptation become honest and powerful. Put marriage out of your girl's head. You are in no sense fit for this. You need years of experience before you can be qualified to understand the duties and take up the burdens of married life. Positively guard your thoughts, your passions, and your affection. Do not degrade this to minister to lust. Elevate them to purify, devote them to God. You may become a prudent, modest, virtuous girl, but not without honest effort. You must watch, you must pray, you must med meditate. You must investigate your motives and your actions. Closely analyze your feelings and your acts. Would you, in the presence of your father, perform an impure action? No, indeed. But you do this in the presence of your heavenly father, who is so much more exalted, so holy, so pure. Yes, you corrupt your own body in the presence of the pure, sinless angels and in the presence of Christ. And you continue to do this irrespective of conscience, irrespective of the light and warnings given you. Remember, a record is made of all your acts. You must meet again the most secret things of your life and so uh, again i warn you as who must meet this line in that day when the case of everyone shall be decided yield yourself to christ without delay he alone by the power of his grace can redeem you from ruin 
He alone can bring your moral and mental powers into a state of health. Your heart may be warm with the love of God, your understanding clear and mature, your conscience illuminated, quick and pure, your will upright and sanctified, subject to the control of spirit of God. You can make yourself what you choose. If you will now face right about, cease to do evil and learn to do well, then you will be happy indeed. You will be successful in the battles of life and rise to glory and honor in the better life than this. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. And so back as we finish here, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but womongers and adulterers God will judge. And so just like any other sin, we have to be faithful at our duty and uh, seek to restore those who are erring. Now, there is no temptation, as we have read, that has come to man that is not able, uh, that God is not able to make us overcome. And so the sin of self-abuse, the affair of the mind, and the sexual excesses exist both outside the marriage and inside the marriage. The Lord himself says that one of the fruit of the spirit is temperance. And man and men and women who have given their lives to God will be temperate in all things and uh, never let their minds wander beyond what the Lord has specified that their thoughts should engage in. And so I pray that uh, if any who is uh, watching and listening to this has been involved in this or uh, is being overcome with this, we can still look at Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our life, and he will be able to give us the strength to overcome every, not only every sin, not uh, this vice act, not only this vice act, but any other sin that we may be struggling with. Today we may point a finger at the person practicing self-abuse. Tomorrow we shall be pointing a finger to uh, a person who is evil surmising and every other sin. But uh, the work of Christianity is not to point fingers, but to point people to Christ. And so today the only remedy for our sin is looking unto Jesus Christ. And may the Lord bless us. And may we take these things at heart. If we are in marriage and we are practicing sexual excesses, let us pray God to give us temperance in all things. This body is the temple of God. The woman's body is the temple of God. And more so, when we talk about the woman, who is the temple, like that sanctuary, the sanctuary in the wilderness had it is appointed feasts, which had their appointed times. A woman has her appointed times. And you could not celebrate the feast of unleavened bread or the first fruit on the day of Passover. Every feast came at its appointed time. So is the body of man, which is that temple, and the body of a woman more so. It has its appointed time. And men should learn to respect it. The high priest went into the sanctuary to perform the sacrifices of different feasts at their appointed time. So also men in marriage can learn to respect the sanctuary that is the body of a woman and approach it in its appointed times. And so this calls for wisdom, this calls for prayers, this calls for temperance so that uh, we may not teach the sanctuary message and miss the vital points that uh, this sanctuary and this temple reflected the body of human beings and God has appointed the temple and whatever in it is in it for the holy services at the appointed time and appropriate time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I think we are told that uh, there is a time and a season for everything. And so if only we could study the will of God in the sanctuary and uh, relate it to our own bodies, we shall see ourselves uh, submitting to the will of God rather than submitting to our, the desires and passions of our bodies. And so may the Lord bless us and keep us, shall we pray. Again, Heavenly Father, thank you that... Uh, it is uh, a decision that you have, we have to make in our lives that we shall serve you. 
and the right use of the will will bring in the power of Jesus Christ to exercise the will of the Father. And so we pray that uh, where we have erred in our marriages and in our past lives that you may forgive us. And Lord, we may start walking in the path which is righteous by the power of the Son. We know that we can do this. And so provide this power in this time and in this day of atonement to your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so may the Lord bless you and uh, keep you for his holy service. Amen.